Hello, Fulton County Library. This is Andrea Davis Pinckney, and I am so delighted to be with you today. I must tell you that I woke up this morning and I said, today is the day I get to virtually go from New York City, where I live, to all of you at the Fulton County Library. Now, I can't see you, but I can absolutely feel your power and your love of reading and books and the joy that we all experience from those pages and words and pictures. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about my work as an author and also as someone who helps other authors make their books. So I wanna begin by saying that I'm so inspired this morning um, that I am going to start with a little bit of a song. If you know this song, you can join me. If you don't know it, my guess is that you are going to catch on. Ready? This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Here at the Fulton County Library, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Now I felt some voices coming through. I love that song and I love it so much because I believe that each and every one of us has a very special light inside. Now, the reason I wanted to begin with that song with all of you is that that is how I begin my day. I start, I wake up and I think about light. I think about the light that is in each and every person. And then I take a moment. Now, I wake up at four o'clock in the morning. Yes, I do, believe it or not. And I sit quietly and I think about the light that is important in every human being. And that is how I start writing my books. So once I've done that and I sit there and I focus on things that really make me happy, my family, my pets. Um, when I had pets, when I was a little girl, I had a dog named Casey. I had a bird named Puddin' Tame. I even had a horse named Richard. I had a guinea pig. I had all kinds of pets. So I think about that and that makes me really happy inside. And then I go to my notebooks. This is one of my notebooks and I don't leave home without them. So any book that you've ever seen written by me started in one of these notebooks. I have notebooks everywhere. I have them in my purse. I have them in my pockets. I have them in my drawers. I keep one in the side of my sock. So when I'm taking a walk outside, I can pull out that notebook and I can write an idea down so that I can remember it. So after that quiet time, I get with my notebook and I start writing. Now, at this time, it's really only about 4.30 in the morning. So I'm not really focused. And what I'm writing is usually a big mess because I don't care about spelling at that time. I just care about getting my thoughts down in that notebook, which may become a book that you read and it may not. But the point is that I'm writing, writing, writing every time, every day, every opportunity I can. And then after I've gotten that little engine of mine revved up, I put on my writing outfit. Would you like to see my writing outfit? Okay, I will share it with you. But again, it's between you and me, my writing outfit. All righty. So, my writing outfit has a couple of pieces to it. Here is piece number one. This, I don't know if you can see it, it's my writing outfit, otherwise known as a Speedo bathing suit. Yeah, it's true. I put this on, my writing outfit. And then here come the accessories to my writing outfit. All right, in order to do this, I have to take off my glasses, and I have to put on a new kind of glasses that are a very important accessory that go with that lovely bathing suit that you just saw. And here they are. These are my swimming goggles, 
which are part of my writing outfit. And here comes the piece de resistance, the final accessory that is part of my writing outfit. Ta-da! It is my bathing suit, bathing cap. And now you get the full effect. So we're now at 5 a.m. in my schedule. I got the bathing suit on. I put on the goggles. I put on the bathing cap. I leave my house in New York City, often in the dark morning, and I rev up and I go over to the YMCA on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, New York, and it is now five o'clock, like I said, and I am banging on the door and I am begging Beverly, the lifeguard, to unlock and let me in so that I can jump in that swimming pool and start my day and get going. Now, all of this happened before we were in a lockdown. So now I do the same thing, but I'm not wearing the goggles and I'm not wearing the bathing cap because my beloved pool is closed. But what I do do is I still wake up early and I leave my house and I go on a very long walk. And guess what I have with me wherever I go? Yes, I have my notebook. Now, one morning before we were in this pandemic, um, I was in the pool. And like I said, my notebooks go where I go. So, and you'll also notice that this particular notebook has a spiral. All my notebooks have spirals because I can then put in a handy dandy pen. So I have no excuse for not getting my writing done. So in goes the spiral in the pen. The pen goes in the spiral. And um, usually I have one of these at the edge of the pool. In case I get a good idea, I want to write it down. Now, one morning, there I was. I'm swimming. I'm feeling happy. I got backstroke going on. I got breaststroke. I got freestyle. I come up with a great idea for a book and for a story. And I reach out at the edge of the pool, and I'm groping around for my notebook. And I realized that I have left my beloved notebook on the dining room table at home. Oh, that is the worst feeling. Now, I did have my pen. So I felt around the edge of the pool and there was the pen. And I was like, okay, great. I have a pen. But then it did dawn on me that I had left the notebook at home. So I was a, at a little bit of a loss. I didn't know what to do. So I am wondering, if you were me, you're in a pool. You got a pen, you got an idea, but you don't have your notebook. What would you do in that situation? Hmm. What would you do in that situation? Well, I've had many people tell me that they would write on their hand. That's a great idea. I have written on my hand on occasion when I can't find a piece of paper. But remember, I was in a pool, so I was going to dive back in, swim around water, chlorine, you know, soap later, idea would have been gone. Um, some folks have said, why didn't you write it on your phone? Well, that's a great idea, but I don't bring my phone down to the pool and it's in my locker and I'd have to leave the pool and anyway. So I'm going to show you what I ended up writing. My idea down on this, you can see it right there. There's my writing. Yeah, that's my flip-flop. So I go for the whole ensemble. I have the goggles, I have the cap, I have the suit, and of course you gotta have the footwear. Notice all the color coordination that I have going on. There you go. But um, yeah, so one of my books started on this flip-flop. And here's the thing, people believe that authors are very serious, that we are sitting in a room on a computer using spell check all day long, that is not necessarily true. I think that real writers are writing anytime, any place that they can. So if you wanna write your own stories, remember, if you're not in a pool and your hand's not gonna get wet, write it on your hand. If you wanna get out of the pool or somewhere and write it on your phone, do that. Um, the main thing is, there are a couple main things. Whatever you do, do not write it on the wall of the YMCA. Don't write it on the towels of the YMCA because they'll take away your membership. Um, write it on a flip-flop. Get it down. That's the main thing that I always tell folks. It doesn't matter. And the thing is, real writers write every single day. 
people ask me, oh, come on, Mrs. Pinkney, do you really write every single day? Yes. Do you write on your birthday? Yes. Do you write on Christmas? Yes. Do you write when your house is a mess? Especially yes, because I don't feel like cleaning it. So that's what we do. Real writers write every single day. Now, one morning, there I am. This was a different day. I'm swimming in the pool and I'm feeling very happy. And got to remember that this is a very early hour of the day. So sometimes I'm the only one in the swimming pool. And this was the case on this particular day. And believe it or not, even though I was the only one in there, I made a friend. I made a friend because I heard a voice talking to me. And the voice said, you may think I look like any other cat, but baby, I'm in a class all by myself. Scat Cat's my name, a name I've earned. Got my name from knowing Ella. Ella Fitzgerald, the queen of scat. Now what's scat, you ask? Scat's the sound that don't hold back. Ella's sound, that was scat. Singing so supreme, music's velvet ribbon dream. Let me tell you Ella's story, because you see, I was there from the get-go. I saw it all, me, Scat Cat Monroe. I watched Ella go from a small town girl to the first lady of song, to a vocal virtuosa bar none. So sit back, listen up, here's four tracks, cut to cut. Here's how Ella got her sound, got her silken silver style, got her lady, Ella, scat. So that's what I heard on that morning. Oh my goodness, I am so glad I had my notebook with me because I immediately grabbed my pen and grabbed my notebook out by the edge of the pool and I wrote it down. And that voice that said, you may think I look like any other cat, that is the narrator to this book, Ella Fitzgerald, and it is narrated by a fictional narrator. You can see him here, right here. There he is. And that is my buddy, Scat Cat Monroe, who tells us Ella Fitzgerald's story, talks to us about her life and her times, and is the one that sees Ella through many hardships and gets her to her exciting new day of becoming the vocal virtuosa that she became. One of my favorite aspects of the Ella Fitzgerald book is one of the final scenes where Ella is flying off on a trumpet. I'm gonna show you right here. She is flying off on a trumpet with the jazz trumpeteer Dizzy Gillespie. And in this part of the book, it says, Ella's singing took her listeners to cloud nine and back. Now, one thing I have learned as the creator of many picture books is that if you don't like to read a lot of my words, you can read the pictures. Reading the pictures counts as reading. It's called visual literacy. So in this scene where it says, Ella's singing took her listeners to cloud nine and back, I want you to find this book in your library and see if on that spread, the artist, Brian Pinckney, who illustrated this book, put nine clouds in that illustration. I want you to find the book, Ella Fitzgerald, look at this page, and tell me if Brian Pinckney read my story. Now, a word about Brian Pinckney. Brian Pinckney is the guy I am married to, and he has illustrated many, many of my books. One of my favorites that Brian and I worked on together is this book. It's called Duke Ellington. You can tell that we really love our jazz music. So this is Duke Ellington. And this is a story about Duke Ellington, the piano prince and his orchestra. One of the things I did not know about Duke Ellington before I started doing research for this book is that Duke Ellington never really wanted to play the piano. When he was a kid, he wanted to do something else. In the opening spread, it says, 
You ever hear of the jazz playing man, the man with the cats who could swing with the band? His name was Edward Kennedy Ellington. But wherever young Edward went, he said, hey, call me Duke. Now Duke was a smooth talking, slick stepping, piano playing kid, but his piano playing wasn't always as breezy as his stride. You can see his mother, Daisy, begging him to practice piano, and his father, J.E., begging him to practice piano, and Duke Ellington doesn't want to do it. He says piano is an umpy dump sound that is headed nowhere worth following. He mwah, kisses that piano a fast goodbye and goes out to play baseball. He wanted to be a baseball player. But then years later, Duke Ellington found a piano in a nightclub and he taught himself to play something known as ragtime music. And that was the thing that changed Duke Ellington's life forever and ever and ever. The other thing I didn't know about Duke Ellington was that in addition to wanting to be a baseball player, he wanted to be a painter. And he thought of jazz music and he thought of painting as the same thing. So if you listen to a lot of Duke Ellington's music, you can almost hear the colors. Now look at Brian Pinkney's wonderful cover. You can see the swirls coming out of the piano. And that is how Duke Ellington thought of his music. Now, since Brian Pinkney could not join us today, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about how he makes some of these paintings. On this cover of, Duke, of Ella Fitzgerald, you'll notice that beautiful Ella is coming out at us, almost like she's a big balloon in the Macy's Day Parade. She is like a big, larger than life figure. And this is where reading the pictures comes in. You can see, look at her dress. Look at the stars behind her. Look at her earrings. They are like scar stars twinkling. And again, she's like a great big planet. Brian works in a technique known as scratchboard. So scratchboard is a whiteboard. It's covered with black ink that he rolls on with a roller. And then he takes a sharp tool and he scratches into that black ink and then he puts the colors down so you can see all of the bright colors that are very luminescent in some of his paintings. Check this one out from Duke Ellington. Here's another one that I'll show you. You can kind of see the scratchiness here. There is a scene in the Cotton Club in Harlem where Duke Ellington is playing piano. Each illustration takes 16 to 20 hours to make. If you want to do scratch board like Brian Pinkney, here's how you can do it. You may have done it before in class or with a friend. You take the white piece of paper and you use crayons and you color, you put the color down first. Then you put the black paint over top and you can take something like the edge of your pen or you can unfold a paper clip and you can scratch in and you can make the artwork like Brian Pinkney. So I'm gonna show you another book that Brian and I have here. And this is a book called Martin Rising Requiem for a King. Now I wanna see by a show of hands out there, how many people have heard of Martin Luther King? I'm gonna raise my hand. If you've heard of Martin Luther King, raise your hand. Okay, I'm guessing that a lot of you have your hands raised. If you have heard of Martin Luther King Jr.'s, I have a dream speech, raise your hand. Okay, I'm guessing that there are a lot of raised hands out there because many people have definitely heard of Dr. Martin Luther King and many people have at least heard of the I have a dream speech. What I had not known a lot about when I wrote this book, Martin Rising, was Martin's final speech before he was sadly assassinated. His final speech was a speech called, I've Been to the Mountaintop. So this book, Martin Rising, talks about the final moments in the life of Dr. Martin Luther King and how his message is so alive today. So in this book, there's the final moment 
where sadly Martin loses his life and leaves this earth. And he says his speech about going to the mountaintop. And I think he knew that his time was limited. But the final, final piece in the book, Martin Rising, which is a collection of poems that take us through those final days and the, the joy that people felt when they came together to fight for social justice. The final poem says, can a dream ever die? A burst of sun replies, Martin's life for peace and good and with love, we all shall rise. And that's what I like to think about. And with love, we all shall rise. The other way that we all rise together is through enjoying pictures and words and books and stories.